When she started in the business, she was known as the Platinum Blonde, a daring sexpot who made audiences blush and censors squirm. But in a string of hits for MGM, she became an acclaimed master of light comedy and a respected dramatic actress who every young ingenue yearned to be. Unfortunately, her off-screen life was marked by controversy and tragedy, even the events surrounding her untimely death. She is the one and only Jean Harlow. Jean was born Harlene Carpenter on March 3, 1911 in Kansas City, Missouri, later taking her mother's maiden name as her stage moniker. Well, Jean Harlow had a very happy childhood. She came from a wealthy family, a very wealthy family. Uh, she was born in the Midwest, and she was an only child. She was adored by her parents. Unfortunately, her parents did not adore each other, so they divorced when Jean Harlow was in her very early teens. And her mother, who was a failed actress, brought her to California. So Jean was basically the product of a stage mother. But Jean married when she was 16 years old and in prep school. They honeymooned in Los Angeles. And just for fun, Jean started applying to the film studios. And she began getting extra work in late 1927 when she was about 16 years old. She did extra work for about three years. She worked with Laurel and Hardy. She was an extra in almost any major film between 1927 and 1929 she may have been in. Now, she was discovered in late 1929 for the Howard Hughes film, Hell's Angels. She did not have the slightest idea what she was doing. She had no dramatic training. She was thrown into a major role in a major film, and she just managed to scrape by. She was a big hit because she was beautiful and wore very low-cut dresses, and it was an exciting film. But poor Jean did not have a clue at that point in her career. After the completion of Hell's Angels, Howard Hughes put Jean under contract. But the movies she made during this period were not very fulfilling for a young actress trying to learn her craft. Critics often panned her performances in such films as Iron Man and The Secret Six, though the Platinum Blonde did become her famous nickname. Probably her most famous picture during this time was William Wellman's The Public Enemy, which set the standard for gangster movies to come. James Cagney starred as criminal Tom Powers, with Gene playing the beautiful blonde he falls for. Harlow's career turned around when MGM bought out her contract for $60,000. They transformed her from a crude sex spot to a refined, able actress and helped develop her natural talents for comedy. Producer Paul Byrne took special interest in the actress's career, and the two soon fell in love. He helped her get roles in higher caliber pictures, like the 1932 drama Red Dust, which paired her with frequent co-star Clark Gable. You talk too much, but you're a cute little trick of that. Why haven't you been around before? Jean played a prostitute on the run from the law who was allowed to stay at the plantation owned by Clark. Don't write to me, brother. After having an affair with Harlow, Gable finds himself falling for his new engineer's wife, Mary Astor. I didn't do anything. He didn't have any reason to believe that I'd... I didn't hear any cries for help. But this tryst is not fated to last, and Clark realizes in the end that Jean is truly the woman for him. Hey, what's the idea? What? You know we drink that water? Stop! Harlow's sexy bath has become the film's most famous scene, though tragically it was shot the same day Jean's husband, Paul Byrne, committed suicide. Paul Byrne was a producer at MGM. He'd been a producer for about 10 years at various studios. He was a rather short, unattractive looking man, and Jean Harlow was attracted to short, rather unattractive men. They became good friends when uh, he became her producer in several films, and he took her seriously as an actress, he took her seriously as a person, and he did not chase her around the desk, which she found very refreshing. They married in 1932, and unfortunately, Paul Byrne had a lot of problems Jean Harlow did not know about. He had a common-law wife in New York who was understandably upset when he got married. 
he had some emotional problems. There are stories that he had attempted suicide several times in the past. He was a very sweet, very intelligent man with a lot of problems. Gene Harlow and he were married for about two months when he committed suicide uh, in his house. No one will ever know what happened the night that Paul Byrne died. Three people know what happened. Paul Byrne, his common-law wife, Dorothy Millette, and Gene Harlow. They all died in the 1930s. So all we can do now is see what is known for sure and make conjectures based on their personalities and what is known. From what we can tell now, Paul Byrne probably committed suicide when Dorothy Millette, his common-law wife, came to California and confronted him with the marriage. Jean Harlow may or may not have been in the house when this happened. Dorothy Millette was almost certainly in the house when Paul killed himself because neighbors saw a woman racing from the house in a car, and Dorothy Millette committed suicide two days later. Paul Byrne's suicide could very easily have ruined Gene Harlow's career. Any kind of scandal really could back then, and it doesn't look good for a sex symbol for her husband to commit suicide two months after they got married. But MGM stood behind her on this, her friends stood behind her on this, and she behaved like a lady. She did not talk to the press, she did not give interviews about it, she just kept quiet and she went back to work several days later. And everyone was very impressed with the fact that she was able to do this. Paul Byrne had to have known that his suicide could have ruined her career. Uh, it was not a very gentlemanly thing to do to her, uh, to commit suicide in their house and to do something that could very well have ruined her life and her career. But she came through it with flying colors and I think the fact that she continued dating, she continued having many friends, she continued being close to her family, she recovered from it. And I think that speaks very well for her emotional stability. People say it was a big tragedy in her life, but in a way it wasn't that big a tragedy because she recovered from it. She married once more after his suicide, she was engaged once more. She did not let Paul Byrne's suicide destroy her or get her down. In 1933, Jean had one of her best roles in the all-star picture, Dinner at Eight. Right? If you think I've been lying to you all the time, you're gonna get the truth now. She was an absolute delight as the cheating wife of boorish Wallace Beery, looking forward to a fancy dinner that she thinks will move them up on the social register. It's the first chance I ever got with decent society people to see my name in the paper with somebody that ain't mixed in your dirty politics. And if I miss it, you're gonna pay for it with everything you got. Oh, Wayne, darling. John Barrymore, Lionel Barrymore, Billy Burke, and Marie Dressler also appeared in the acclaimed picture. But it was Harlow who offered up the film's comic highlights. Her conversation with Dressler at the conclusion remains one of the funniest exchanges ever recorded. I want to sit next to Oliver. Oliver, where's Oliver? Oliver, 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 Oliver. Jean rounded out the year, starring in Hold Your Man. And marrying cameraman Harold Rawson though that union would only last a year. She later fell madly in love with fellow MGM player William Powell, famous for his portrayal of Nick Charles in the Thin Man series. Hello, uh, another glass. How are you? You know, we do know each other. Certainly, we've known each other for years. Aren't you Nick Charles? Yeah. You don't remember me. I'm Dorothy Wynum. He would be the great love of her life. But though they were engaged, they never married. MGM wanted to capitalize on the romance, so after Jean completed The Girl from Missouri, she starred with Powell in the romantic musical Reckless. Unfortunately, Jean was not suited for the musical genre. Her singing had to be dubbed, 
and her lack of dancing ability was covered by creative editing. But she remained a treat, playing a Broadway actress whose romance with industrialist French Tone makes her loving agent Powell jealous. Ain't I a man like everybody else? No. Huh? Oh, Mona? Uh, this is Sherbet that's been looking for you. Am I intruding? No, it was I that did the intruding. Man, for the first time in my life, I'm scared. Now, baby, take it easy. That same year, Harlow could be found alongside old pal Clark Gable in the rousing actioner China Seas. Gable portrayed a tramp steamer captain who fears pirates may attack his boat while en route from Singapore to Hong Kong. On board are two ex-lovers, cultured Rosalind Russell and the more earthy Jean, who later blunders into aiding the pirates when she befriends scalawag in disguise Wallace Beard. There was the master of the most adventurous ship on the China Seas, Skipper Gasco, and the lady known as China Doll, the mystery man whom everyone knew, yet no one knew. You're with me from now on, or I'm going to break that pretty little neck of yours just like an ocean. Ah! Ah! But you taught me something I didn't even know myself. When a woman can love a man right down to a fingernail, she can hate him the same way. Get out of here. Oh, I got a mighty good reason for being here. You've always got a good reason for anything you do. In fact, I don't know anybody that can think of any more remarkable reasons than you can on short notice. Listen to me, I took an awful chance coming here. I might have got heaved over. Well, don't run any more risk by staying. In Riff Raff, Harlow hid her platinum blonde hair under a brown wig to play a cannery worker who falls in love with fisherman Spencer Tracy. Off our sweat. Pipe down, Dutch. This ain't the place. Let me alone. I got a right to talk. Tell him where to head in, Dutch. You're heading for trouble. You mean he's heading for trouble? You got a ear full of what they said, didn't you? Uh, everybody will be sober in the morning and they spit in your eyes. Is that so? Yeah. The film follows the ups and downs of their relationship, from Spence being booted out of the union to Harlow giving birth while serving time for stealing. Oh, Dutch! Take what you need from my closet now. Watch out for the cops. Oh, I knew you'd come, Doc. Hello, Squirt. Joseph Kaya, Una Merkel, and Mickey Rooney rounded out the movie's fine supporting cast. Have a drink? Sure. Come on. Thank you. You're a pretty smart lad, huh? By this point, audience favorite Jean was at the peak of her popularity. Young actresses arriving in Hollywood wanted to be just like her and Harlow lookalikes began popping up in casting offices all around town. Jean rode high on her success and joined William Powell, Myrna Loy, and Spencer Tracy in the classic 1936 screwball farce, Libeled Lady. I tell you, I can't go now. The paper's in a jam. We're facing a libel suit. Well, you're facing a breach of promise suit. If you don't want to marry me, just say so. I'm glad you're getting yourself all upset, darling, over here at Little Drinky Man. No, not today I don't. Today I get married. Will you marry me? Well, Connie, I... Will you, Bill? Will I? The film story dealt with wealthy Loy suing a newspaper for libel because of some unkind remarks they made about her. Rather than pay, the editor and star reporter, with the help of Jean, concoct a scheme to prove what they said about the woman was true. Would I ask you to do this thing for me if I didn't consider you practically as my wife? Well, would you ask your wife to hook up with that ape? The ape objects. Women can't fool women about men. You don't want to know. Oh, no? Huh. Oh, I know. You've got him now. In name, anyway. But I have his love. They're married, all right. Oh, but that's often. You mean it's bigamy? 
Well, what a story. Constance Allenbury marries bigamist. <laughs> if you uh, publish that, you'll have another libel suit on your hands. I'm not a bigamist. You married me, didn't you? Well, uh, uh... Crazy situations and the required romantic entanglements ensue, with everything naturally turning out all right in the end. You know, you've had this coming for a long time. Yes, yes and I've been looking forward to really? settle it right now. With interest. Yes. Yeah. Who do you think this is? Tim. No. Try again. Uh, Finney? No. Try again. Why, you? <laughs> <laughs> Surprise? A husband. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Thank you for a lovely evening. Thank you. Good night. Not good. Just there. Loy and Harlow also co-starred that same year in Wife vs. Secretary, a drama that also featured, who else? Clark Gable. You're the top? The only best, always. Mm. You know, someday they're going to put us both in a wheelchair. And then when my lumbago isn't bothering me, mm, honey, you look out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, B.S. I thought you were married. <laughs> How are you, Whitey? Been behaving yourself? Why, certainly. Cross your heart? Have you been true to me? Well, why? In the picture, Clark raises the ire of wife Myrna when he hires voluptuous Jean as his new secretary. What are you good at this? <laughs> Thanks, V.S. Clarence Brown directed the film as a mature and intelligent piece that ultimately asks the question, which one should Clark choose? Pretty soon he'll want to bond me, That's how it always starts. And then it'll be too late. Because if he ever turns to me, I won't turn away. Not an easy decision to make. Gene Harlow was shooting the 1937 picture Saratoga with Gable and Lionel Barrymore when she fell ill from uremic poisoning. Set in the world of horse racing, the comedy has Jean falling in love with gambler Clark, despite her marriage to Walter Pidgeon. Unfortunately, Jean died of cerebral edema on June 7th of that year before filming could be completed. MGM was going to shelve the movie, but Harlow's fans bombarded the studio with letters requesting the picture be finished. Using doubles, Saratoga ultimately wrapped and was released to an eager public. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the management of this theater, I want to announce the next attraction, the unfinished love story. I refer to Saratoga, starring Clark Gable and Jean Harlow. The picture which the theater goers of the world have insisted through letters, telegrams, and petitions be finished. Unfortunately, rumors surrounding Harlow's tragic end quickly became the talk around town. It was believed that the actress's Christian scientist mother, Mama Jean, kept the star from receiving proper medical treatment. But now, these stories are believed to be untrue. Jean Harlow died at the age of 26, which is amazing because she looked like she was in her early 30s in most of her movies. She had been suffering from kidney disease for about nine months before she died. I managed to get her hospital records through the cooperation of her family, and she had constant medical treatment. There were rumors later on that her mother was a Christian scientist and would not allow her medical treatment, which is totally false. Jean Harlow was making a film called Saratoga with Clark Gable, which was a racehorse comedy. It was a cute little film, and she was not well during the filming. You can see she looked rather bloated. Uh, she did not look her best. And she really struggled. She was really a trooper. She got to the set, and she did her scenes, and she went and rested in her dressing room. She saw doctors, and nobody really knew what was wrong with her yet. But in the middle of filming Saratoga, she collapsed on the set and was taken home. 
After two days, she was taken to the hospital, and she died there of kidney failure. Now, Saratoga was about three quarters completed at that time, and there was a lot of discussion as to what to do with the film. But her fans wanted to see her, and MGM knew darn well that people would flock to see Jean Harlow's last film. So that had a lot to do with keeping her in the movie. They used several uh, doubles, and there was a very disturbing scene in her last movie where her fiancé is trying to convince her that she's sick, so she'll stay in a certain spot. And they have a doctor come in and examine her, and Jean Harlow is lying there in bed, and the doctor is examining her, and she's going, I'm telling you, doctor, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm perfectly healthy. And two weeks later, she was dead, and she was actually buried in the negligee she was wearing during that scene. The fascination with Jean continued spreading over the decades to the point that two biographies, both called Harlow, were filmed simultaneously in 1965. Producer Joseph Levine's version starred Carol Baker in the title role and also featured Martin Balsam, Peter Lawford, Red Buttons, and Angela Lansbury as Mama Jean. Mama, do you want to know about this, this lover of yours, your great Latin bed partner? Do you want to know what he wanted to do, tried to do ever since he got in this house? Shall I tell you? No, I don't want to hear it. Harlow. <laughs> Though the production was a happy one and the cast enjoyed working with each other, Levine himself was furious when producer Bill Sargent released his film biography a month earlier. I think that the other picture is a, is a despicable trick. I think that if this practice were to continue, uh, I, I can liken it only by saying that George Stevens made a picture called The Greatest Story Ever Told. He spent $22 million. What would happen if this man decided tomorrow he'd make a seven-day picture called The Greatest Story Ever Told? And what would happen if he suddenly decided to make the Bible, which Dino De Laurentiis is making for $17 million? And all the company presidents are very smug, but I can tell you that they can be mixed. I think it's a real threat to the business. In order to speed up his production, Sargent used a process called electronovision, which used a video-to-film transfer and photographed the story like a stage play. You know, I have no feud with Levine or anyone. We were out to make a motion picture. We finished it at 6.25 tonight. It's a great motion picture. It's not just a motion picture. Carol Lindley played Jean this time, with Ginger Rogers replacing Judy Garland as the actress's domineering mother. Unfortunately, neither film captured the fascinating mystique of Jean Harlow. With relatively few films to her credit, she remains one of the most intriguing stars to emerge from the golden years of cinema. Alluring and beautiful, the platinum blonde was able to survive critical drummings and change her image, emerging as one of MGM's greatest talents. Even the tragedies of her life were unable to hide the fact that she was a fine actress and a gifted comedian. Hollywood will always remember Jean Harlow.